It's a long episode, so I'll keep this short. I'm fat, and I talk about what it's like to be a big old fatty fat. Plus, even though we don't celebrate Valentine's Day here, it's the year of the saints, so damn right I'm talking about Saint Valentine. really get started, can I talk to you for a second? (laughs) Of course I can. It's a podcast. It's literally how this works. Okay, so Joe Rogan, Roid Rage Tony Danza, he's an asshole. He's what a dumb guy thinks a smart guy sounds like. And he's spreading bullshit about COVID, about the COVID vaccines, about COVID treatments. Ugh, just ugh. He's doing that puffed up, ultra testosterone hey, I'm just asking questions here thing, when really what he's doing is getting people killed by feeding their ignorance with arrogance. And I love that artists like Neil Young and Jody Mitchell, who both had polio when they were children, so they don't fuck around with pandemics, kids, have pulled their content from Spotify, saying that as long as Spotify carries Joe Rogan's show, they can't stream their music. And people like, you know, Brene Brown and other big shots are pulling their podcasts from Spotify as well. And, you know, if we were big shots, we would do that too. But let's be honest, we're not. And if we just vanished off of Spotify, we'd be scared of losing the handful of listeners we have there. But you, if you're listening to us on Spotify right now, you have some power because you're their customer. We're just some piddly little speck of product, but you, you're valuable. May I interest you in a new podcast platform? Good Pods, for example. Or heck, anyone you want. If you listen to Bitch and Boutique, I think it's a safe bet that you're not tied to any of those Spotify exclusives. So, Walking away from Spotify shouldn't be so hard. And if it is, is there something I can do to make it worth your while? For real. I'll holler your name on the show as a goddamn hero if you do this. Be a badass bitch. Do it for your old pal Amelia. And for your conscience. You know, I... I didn't necessarily plan on getting into something really heavy right off the bat, but something was going around, you know, the social media and, um, it just completely blew my mind. And it's, it's one of those things where I get very excited when someone else is expressing something that like, yes, that, that, that's exactly what I would have said if I could, I wish those had been the words that had come out of my mouth because they just said it so perfectly. And it's uh, a woman on TikTok. Her name's um, Elise Myers. I'll I'll link it. I, I may even I may even try and grab an audio snippet if I can. Um, but she was talking about how when she was you know when she was a kid, especially in junior high, she was on the chubby side. And one day when she was in seventh grade she was talking to her friends about how she couldn't wait to get to high school because she really wanted to be a cheerleader. And this man who was a substitute teacher who basically that day was the only day in her entire life she was ever going to see him. Like he, he didn't exist outside of that day, but for some reason he thought that it was appropriate and even necessary to interject himself into their conversation and to say to this, you know, 
twelve year old girl, no, you 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 really need to give that up. Like it's really not appropriate for you to even think about being a cheerleader. Like, you know, maybe you should think about something like marching band or, you know, maybe be a wrestler or something, but you in a cheerleading outfit, the world doesn't need that. You know, that kind of a asshole-ish comment. And her whole post was about how, you know, it was an offhand remark by some rando that she was never going to see again, but it was something that stayed with her like the rest of her fucking life. And how people, especially people who are around young people, but really around anyone, they really need to consider the words that come out of their mouths. And, you know, that something that you're just making an offhand remark and it doesn't mean anything to you and you're going to go on with your life is potentially going to destroy the dreams of a kid. And I guarantee you the people who are, there are people who are listening right now who a hundred percent know what I mean. And then some of you are going, yeah, I don't get that. I don't, I don't know why anyone would, why, why would you even listen to that guy? You know, why, why would you take that seriously? Why, you know, you, you know, you shouldn't take someone's opinion of what you look like so seriously. And it's like, well, you know, there are people who are told not only by their families, but by the entire world from the moment that they are conscious enough to be aware of the world around them, that what they look like is wrong and that they should be ashamed of it. And that other people who don't look like them are terrified of ever becoming them. You know, the diet industry exists because skinny people don't want to look like me. And even though I don't buy into the diet industry bullshit, the fact that other people will spend billions of dollars, you know, it's a huge industry. And the fact that I'm almost always surrounded by people, pretty much anywhere I go, I will be near people who are talking about what they're eating, what they're not eating, uh, how many pounds they lost, what their goal is, um, you know, Ooh, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Have you done keto? Have you done paleo? Have you done, you know, as if anybody, well, I shouldn't say as if anybody cares because obviously a lot of people care because a lot of people won't shut the fuck up about it. But the rest of us who are, you know, the dreaded, if you don't buy into this bullshit, you might look like her, you know, what the fuck are we supposed to think? And, you know, loving myself and having self-confidence or whatever. That's, that doesn't change what goes on around me every day. You know, it doesn't change the fact that I can't, a lot of times when I get on a plane, the seatbelt won't fasten. There was one flight where... I could not get the seatbelt to fasten and I faked it. I made it look like it was fastened and I didn't say anything because I didn't want to draw attention to the fact that I couldn't fasten the seatbelt. And if there had been turbulence or anything on that flight, I would have gone flying out of my seat. And I would have been seriously injured because I was embarrassed to ask for a seatbelt extender. I have purchased them since then. 
I actually own some. I've never had to use them, but I do own some. Like, just in case. And here's the thing. I, you know, this show, you know, we sort of present, you know, a gay guy and his fat friend talking about everything, you know. And when we started this show, I really thought I was going to talk about, you know, fat stuff a lot more. But I I figured out pretty quickly that it's harder to talk about than I thought it was going to be. Not that it's hard for me to talk about because, I mean, here I am talking about it. But who you're talking to really affects what that conversation sounds like. And it's not Pitney's fault. You know, way, way early on, um, we did an episode... I actually looked it up to make sure how long ago it was. It was episode 57. It was called Judgy McJudgerson. We did, we did an episode where we were sort of talking, sharing stories about when we were sort of being judged harshly by strangers and being treated badly in public. And the episode starts with me telling a story about having, having the nerve to exist as a fat person in public that my husband and I, you know, were being, being fat out in the world. And I just, I start to tell the story and I, and Pitney lost his shit. Like he could not, he, I mean, I don't think I got 60 seconds into talking before he stopped me to let me know that he doesn't think of me as fat. And I really did not know how to respond to that because he's known me since I was 14. Now, granted, I was smaller when I was 14, but I've been plus sized since that age. You know, I was, I was not thin ever. And he's known me bigger than 300 pounds. But when I used the word fat to describe myself, even though I used it in the tagline of the show and I've used, you know, you know, I used it in promotional materials and whatever for the, for the podcast when we were first starting, he never questioned it. But when I said it out loud on the show, he lost his mind and kept saying, I don't think of you that way. I don't think of your husband that way. I love you. I don't, you know, I've never thought of you guys like that. And I was like, but you can see me though. You can see how fat I am. And he couldn't, he couldn't accept me talking that way. And I had to keep reminding him. It's like, my being fat is not a value judgment. My being fat is a, is a, a descriptive word. It's like, well, I'm not thin, so I'm fat. You know, if, if a woman who weighs 160 pounds is considered fat, then what's a woman who weighs 260 pounds? You know, what's a man who weighs 360 pounds? they're fat, right? I mean, it doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean anything other than they're fat. But the reason why I bring it up is that I realized that when we were working on that episode, that it was going to be harder to talk about fat stuff than I thought. Because I couldn't I had a lot of things to say about how fat people are treated and how I've been treated and how people I know have been treated, you know, in public by doctors, by waiters, by whatever. And it never, because it was a conversation with someone who could not wrap his brain around it, 
And it's, like I said, not his fault. I mean, he understands being discriminated against for other reasons. But he cannot even see that I'm a fat person. So it it was almost like he couldn't understand the story I was telling. Even though I thought I was being very clear. So maybe it's easier for me to get the story out if I don't have someone asking me questions or making comments that are like derailing what I was saying or trying to convince me that I'm not as fat as I think I am or whatever. Because the fact is, I'm fat. I am. It's fine. And and I also have, you know, because I'm a fat person, I also have this automatic thing where I feel compelled to tell you that I'm also pretty fucking healthy. But the thing is, even if I wasn't healthy, who the fuck gives a shit? Because even if I wasn't healthy, it doesn't matter. You know? Pitney's not healthy. Pitney has all kinds of health problems. He's been smoking since he was like 16. You know, he has all kinds of health problems, but he's skinny. And you wouldn't know it to look at him. And no one would assume that he had all kinds of health problems because he's skinny. And he's always been skinny. And nobody would, you know, dive into random spaces on the internet to insist that Pitney do things differently with his life because, you know, that he needs to change his diet and he needs to do all these things differently because they can tell by looking at him that he's not healthy. Whereas, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of pictures of us, you know, like promoting the show. Mainly because... I don't, I don't like having my picture taken. That's like my entire fucking life. You know, you, you start your, your life very, very young with people telling you that the way you look is unacceptable and you pretty much figure out right away that, okay, then no one needs to be looking at me. You know, if, if no one, if, if the way I look is so terrible, then I guess I'll just go hide under a blanket. So that no one has to be offended by my hideousness, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether or not it's true. You know, it doesn't matter if I believe it, you know, like intellectually, anyone who had any kind of childhood trauma knows it doesn't matter what you know in your brain is true. Your, your mind has another agenda for you. I'm Dean. I'm the dad. I'm Laura. I'm the mom. And I'm Krista. I'm the daughter. And together we are Family Plot, a show about strange history, weird true crime, fanciful folk tales, and all things paranormal. We keep it PG-13. I'm only 12, Dad. It's okay, honey. So listen to our show and join the family. Available wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes drop on Thursday. And we range from stories that are local to us and as far away as the farthest star. That was very nice, Krista. So let our family entertain yours. Join us for every episode of Family Plot. Bye! Bye. But, uh, I did want to... I did want to bring up one thing, though. Um, One thing that I saw um, sometime during the past year, sometime during 2021, I can't remember how long ago now. You know, Jonah Hill, he goes through since, you know, since the first time we saw him in like Super Bad when he was like a chubby teenager. And then, you know, in different roles throughout his career, he's sort of his weight has fluctuated. And... 
you know, a lot of times with men, when you see their weight fluctuate as actors, there's like this assumption that they're doing it on purpose. You know, it's like, oh, well, Robert De Niro, you know, gained weight to play this part and lost weight to play that part or whatever. Um, and so no one really, they don't really question it a lot when men gain and lose weight. But apparently, you know, social media makes it possible for people to, you know, obviously comment on the appearance of the appearance of people they don't know. And Jonah apparently at some point last year sort of made a statement sort of to the world saying like, Hey, um, it'd be really, really nice if people could stop commenting on my appearance. Cause whether you're saying I look good or I look bad, whatever you're saying, it, it really isn't helpful and it really doesn't feel good. And I would rather you not comment at all. And the fact that he said that, like, made the news. And I, I immediately jumped on the fact that, oh, well, a man is asking for people to be nicer to him. And the media goes, well, look at this. Let's all, we, should, should we maybe consider being nicer to this young man? Perhaps, perhaps we've been wrong. But of course, what, you know, with no sense of irony, every time there's an article that talks about him basically begging for people to stop commenting on his appearance, every one of those articles will show a series of photos of him at various weights. And, you know, there'll be a caption under each one of when it was and like what, what movie he was doing at the time or what event he was at and when it was, when it took place so that the article, the article itself will feature the exact behavior that he's asking to stop. So, you know, assholes, all of them, but you know, people like me who have, you know, well, I, I shouldn't say I have no platform. I'm talking into a microphone right now. Um, and, you know, a couple dozen people are going to hear me. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's not like, it's not like, you know, Adele or Melissa McCarthy or, you know, just all kinds of, you know, Lizzo or whatever. It's not like all kinds of women haven't said over the years, could y'all calm down with the constant commentary on how big my ass is or whatever, you know, and how, how fuckable I am today compared to how fuckable I was six months ago. Like nobody asked you and it really doesn't actually have anything to do with my worth as a human. And could you just not maybe, but no one cares when a woman like begs for people to stop commenting on her appearance. But you know, one dude goes, Hey, it kind of hurts my feelings a little bit. And all of a sudden it's headlines everywhere. Although since I mentioned Adele and Lizzo, there was a period last year where Lizzo was wearing some kind of a, you know, some kind of a skin tight outfit that she frequently does. And people were horrified you know, people get very upset whenever whenever Lizzo has the nerve to present herself in a way that shows you that she likes the way she looks and she's comfortable and she's happy. Because the world doesn't want Lizzo to be happy. Have you noticed that? Like, when Adele was still really fat, people... We're happy to be like, oh, Adele is so lovely. She's so lovely. She's so talented. But nobody criticized the way Adele dressed or the way she, you know, her personality or anything else. No one criticized Adele because Adele had the good sense to sing sad songs. You know, she was a white woman who was always being sad. 
And that's appropriate for a fat girl. Lizzo is a bad bitch. And she wants everyone to know it. And man, are people uncomfortable with that. God damn it, I love Lizzo. She's so she's so unbelievably gorgeous if I could be half as gorgeous as her. And she is so talented and she is so brilliant and she's so fucking funny. And I think Adele pretty much stands at a microphone and sings. Lizzo never stops moving. I mean, once again, it's not about, you know, look at her proving that she has all this cardiovascular health, but Jesus Christ, watch her perform sometime. You know, that woman could run circles around all of us in stiletto heels and she'll kick your ass. So no one needs to be commenting. (laughs) You know, I just, I just, it fascinates me. I, I just, I don't get it. And also no one, no one cares. No one cares if you, if you want to fuck someone. I mean, I, I sure as hell don't. I mean, you know, let's, let's go ahead and make it about me again. I really don't care. You know, random guy on the internet. I really, really don't care if you want to fuck me or not. I do not, I do not exist for you to, you know, fap to my picture or whatever. I really, really do not care at all. You know, if I, you know zhuzh my hair and put on makeup or whatever. I, if I feel like, you know, tarting myself up because we're doing a live stream or whatever, I, if I want to, you know, look a certain way, I want to look that way because I feel like looking a certain way. I'm not doing it for you. I don't even know who, who the fuck you are. I'm not doing it for random guys because I want to get their attention. I'm doing it for me. And... I got a man. So fuck you. I don't, you know, and, and women online, you know, I mean, I realize that I, I don't get as much as some of the other women do of the, you know, unsolicited dick pics and that kind of stuff. I don't get nearly as much because I don't put it out there as much, but there was a period where, um, I was getting, even like on my, before I, before I, I made my Facebook page more, more private, before I increased the privacy on it, I would get weird, weird friend requests and weird messages from random guys. And there's one that I saved just a guy who's dead now. Cause I went, I went to go, I wanted to show the message to someone and I clicked on his profile and I found out it's now a memorial because apparently he had died like a year earlier. And it was just like, oh, I'm so not sad about that because he's a fucking creep, that dude. But he sent me a message out of the blue just saying that I would look really good in latex and that um, I should really think about, you know, wearing really, really tight latex. And it's like, uh, who the fuck are you, old man? creepy old dude. And you know, the audacity, the fucking audacity, you know, random, random dudes. And the thing is, if I had responded to him in a negative way, I know that the response would have been, oh, you're an ugly fat bitch, lesbian, whatever, you know, because that's, that's how men are. You know, they think, Hey, I just paid you a compliment. What the fuck's wrong with you that you can't take a compliment? It's like, that's not, that's not a compliment. You know, I don't exist for you to unload your shit at me. And if I don't respond to you and you decide to just keep talking and then you've invented an entire relationship because you don't shut up. And then that, and and at the end of it, you're mad at me and you're telling me that, that it's over. And it's like, dude, I, this is entirely a one side thing. Like, you know, I haven't said word, you know, I, I don't have to deal with that as much as some women do, but 
because mainly because I don't take pictures of myself and put them on the internet. But God, I know that if I did, it would be nonstop. And it does sort of, you know, save my, save my sanity a little teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny bit by limiting that kind of bullshit. Cause I got plenty of it as it is. without talking about St. Valentine, right? I mean, he's like one of the dudes. Except really, he's like a dozen or more dudes. And also, a few chicks. Because Valentine is one of those names that means strength, so it's been super popular for literally millennia. So, there are actually a lot of St. Valentines. Saints Valentine? Anyway. The St. Valentine was a guy who died around 270 AD-ish, and there are all sorts of similar but slightly conflicting and impossible to prove stories about him, but the church's general consensus is he was probably at some point the bishop of what is now the Diocese of Terni Narni Amelia, ahem, ahem, And he was definitely martyred by Emperor Claudius II for helping young Christians get married, which was especially criminal in the eyes of the emperor because he liked his young men single and easy to send off to war without so much as a backwards glance. And he was likely beheaded, which is like so metal, and is probably why more than one church claims to have his skull. More on that in a second. One thing that's super unique about old St. V is that even though he's like this big pop culture dude before pop culture was even a thing, officially the church doesn't know enough about him for him to have this big status. So in 1969, they took him off the liturgical calendar. So February 14th is still his feast day because it's supposedly the day he was executed, but, you know, it's also commercial and whatnot. So, obvi, he's the patron saint of engaged couples and happy marriages and lovers and stuff. But what's really fun is he's also the patron saint of beekeepers and traveling and epilepsy and fainting and plague. So, hey, celebrate St. Valentine's Day this year by punching an anti-vaxxer in the ding-ding. But, Amelia, I hear you saying, you said something about a skull. Right. So I guess the first thing I really need to talk about is what I mean when I talk about a relic. Now, a relic is often an item owned by a saint, or even just touched by them. But the really special relics are, you know, body parts. And sometimes they're whole bodies. And we'll get to the incorruptibles later, because those are a whole other world. But anyway, there are quite a few Valentine reliquaries out there. A reliquary is the fancy thing the relic is kept in. Some have drops of blood, some have bone fragments, but the ultimate relic, the piece de resistance, is his skull. Even though quite a few churches claim to have fragments of old V's saintly noggin, there are two that are quite certain they have his whole head. First, there's a gorgeous, oval-shaped reliquary 
that sort of reminds me of a golden Atomic Age TV set with two big lion feet in the Basilica di Santa Maria in Cosmedin in Rome. And it holds the alleged skull of the real beheaded St. Valentine. Now, this skull wears a crown of flowers, and it doesn't have a mandible, you know, the jaw, the lower jaw. He's also got a charming gap between his top two teeth, which I think is kind of adorable. And by the way, the Basilica di Santa Maria is the place in Roman holiday where Gregory Peck put his hand in the mouth of the carving on the wall and pretended it bit his hand off. Now, what I can't seem to find out in my piddling research is if those are real flowers on top of the skull, and if someone goes in there every once in a while and changes them out. Because they look weirdly fresh, but not super fake. Like, imagine being the dude whose job it is to make a fresh flower crown for St. Valentine, like, once a month. Somebody at least dust the thing, because when you look at all the pictures online, they all look super similar, but not exactly the same. But one thing that's clearly visible in every photo? That cute janky gap in his front teeth. And I swear I have a reason for mentioning that. So like, after visiting the Basilica di Santa Maria, you can swing on by the little Italian town of Monselice, just down the road from Venice, where in what I hear is a lovely place called the Villa Duodo, Lovely, except for a rather handsy caretaker, but hey, Italy, you know. They totally swear they have a bunch of whole skeletons of saints in this one teensy chapel. But they they look sort of like stumpy short mannequins sleeping on shelves, with skulls for heads all dressed to the nines, holding golden chalices like the pimps they are, and bearing signs identifying them as whatever martyrs those folks totally believe they are. And Valentine is one of them, or so they say. So Rome has a lot of catacombs full of skeletons, right? Well, there was this period where rich folks were literally buying skeletons from the catacombs, believing that if they were entombed down there, they must have been important people, like martyrs and stuff and taking care of the bones of someone saintly would give you brownie points with God. And if you're an aristocrat, you've done some god-awful shit, so you need all the points you can get if you've got a shot at heaven. So whoever the dude who built this villa and chapel was, he bought a bunch of dead people and crammed them in there, labeling them as various saints. The reason they look so short is because he tossed the leg bones, so they're all just skull, torso, arms, and feet. Cute, huh? Anyway, the bodies are dressed in royal colors, all fancy, and the hands are in white gloves, and the skulls are just naked skulls, like not even a hat. But back to Valentine. This Valentine skull is complete with the mandible. And dude has a full set of teeth, top and bottom, like almost shockingly good choppers for a guy who came out of the catacombs. He's like a toothpaste commercial over there. And the locals love celebrating him on February 14th and make a really big deal. And why not? Nobody can prove nothing. So, Here's my take, though. If it had to be one or the other, it's the one in Rome with the janky teeth. Who the hell had a full set of perfectly straight pearlies in, like, biblical times? Please. But do I think the other skeleton is St. Valentine? Also, yes. Because there are a lot of those. So it totally could be. And isn't that just like a Valentine? only barely based in reality if it exists at all, and celebrated by people who just really want to believe in something real bad. I I do real quick, 
quick, I do want to kind of uh, circle back a little tiny bit. The, the thing on TikTok that inspired this. One of the things that, that she said when she was talking about how the random comment by some guy when she was in seventh grade kind of, you know, destroyed her. And, you know, she really wanted to be a cheerleader and he crushed that. And, you know, when she thinks back on it, like all these, all these kids, all these young girls in particular who are some offhand comment by some stranger completely destroys some dream that they have because they're thinking, oh, well, I shouldn't even try to do anything. And how, how easy that is for one comment to fucking destroy a kid. And I was thinking about me. And I mean, I had plenty. I had plenty of that kind of shit. Of comments when I was young. You know. Any, anything that, that I would have wanted 20 pounds was in the way, you know, well, if you'd lose 20 pounds, then blank, you know, if you just lose 20 pounds, then whatever it is we were just talking about would happen for you. You know, those, those sorts of messages were very common. And the, the really weird thing is that when I thought back after watching her video, I, the first thing I thought of was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be a cheerleader. I mean, there was nothing like that because by the time I was, you know, in junior high, I was already pretty, pretty much curled up in the fetal position and didn't want anyone to look at me. But, you know, surely I had some kind of dream. I had something that I wanted to do or that I wanted to be. But after watching her video, I thought about it for a while. And I, it really bothered me that I was like, I don't even remember. I don't remember wanting to do something. And I know that like, not everybody, you know, not everybody, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, not everybody has like a plan or like, Oh, you know, by the time you're a freshman in high school, you've already decided what you're going to major in in college or, you know, whatever that is, or you know what your job's going to be and you work towards it. Not everybody has that. I definitely didn't have that. But I didn't have, like, anything, even remotely, like that. And I am 100% willing to bet that the reason why it didn't even occur to me to have a dream as a kid was because I was fairly constantly being told that I was too fat. Like, even if it wasn't those exact words, you know, when you're, when fat is the worst thing you can be because the world tells you and you're being reminded all the time that you're fat, that whatever it is that you are is the thing that nobody wants to be because it's bad and it's wrong and it's ugly and it's awful. And you'll never get anywhere and no one will ever love you and whatever. If you are young enough that your brain isn't formed yet, why would that kid bother to have a dream? You know, and this is not a, let's everybody feel sorry for Amelia. This is a watch what the fuck you say to people. This is me taking what Elise Myers said on TikTok and running with it. This is words actually matter especially when you're talking to a young person because it is so, so easy 
to fucking destroy a kid. And you're never going to even remember you said it, whatever that thing is that you said. I guarantee you the people who crushed me as a child, most of them probably don't even remember I exist. And the ones who do definitely would never remember the things they said because they didn't think they were saying anything bad or serious or it was just a joke or whatever. All because I had a few extra pounds on me. And now I have a lot of extra pounds on me. And yet somehow I'm doing pretty fucking okay. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of argument within like, you know, therapy communities and stuff. When people say, you know, my trauma made me stronger or whatever. There's a lot of people say, no, you shouldn't say that because my, your trauma made you traumatized. It's like, yeah, but damn it. I don't know. Would I be funny? Would I, you know, would I be the person I am right now? If I hadn't been shit on so much as a kid. It's, uh, you know, and I still, you know, if you, if you go back and listen to that episode, that Judgy McJudgerson episode, and you hear me talking about how pissed off I was being treated like shit by that, by the waiter and then by the other waiter in a completely different Applebee's, uh, that story is so terrible. I don't want to go into it again, but I mean, you know, not really tipping very much is really not the same thing as causing a scene or whatever and complaining to management. I complained to management the first time. I mean, that's why there was a second time because I had a a free meal to, to cash in. But I didn't really stand up for myself as much as I could have. And it's because it's really fucking hard. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still learning how to stand up for myself. You know, it's not all about the fat, but you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty damn big deal to actually say to the person who just wronged you to actually be like, no motherfucker, look me in the eye. Now you explain to me why you just did that. I mean, you know, in a nutshell, if you want to, you know, if you, if you want a reason to go back, the, the story that I'm, that, that I'm alluding to in that episode is my husband and I went to a restaurant and because there were, there were no other people in the restaurant. So it's not like they confused orders or anything like that. They saw two fat people and instead of giving us what we ordered, I mean, we, we'd never been there before. We didn't know what their portions were like. We didn't know anything. They looked at two fat people and s- decided that clearly what these two fat people wanted was four entrees and an appetizer. We just added salads to our entrees, but the waiter took that to mean, oh, they're, they're ordering some big entree size salad off of the menu, which we didn't. We just added a side salad. He just brought us these big salads and we didn't know because we'd never been there before. And, uh, that's just the beginning of the story. But the fact that someone would look at two people and say, well, logically, these two fat asses clearly are going to sit here and eat four entrees and an appetizer because they're fat. And that's what fat people do. 
And I really, really, really hope that everyone listening is really uncomfortable because I just said it that way. I know when I told it the first time, it made Pitney really, really uncomfortable. You know, in part because I was talking about something that happened to me, but also because I was saying it like that. It's like, no, they were saying, oh, look at the lard asses. Look at the big fat lard asses coming into our restaurant. Ha ha. Let's, let's go, let's go take a wheelbarrow full of food over to them because they're fat. And we were just innocently going, wow, these, these salads are big, but that's just the beginning of the story. So yeah. Anyway. (sighs) But I will say one other thing. And this is just a little aside. Um, The body positivity movement, that's great. It's lovely. What a a nice idea. But the body positivity movement is a touchy-feely thing that actually serves no purpose. Getting me to love my body doesn't change anything. It might make me more able to stand up to my doctor if my doctor is giving me bad care. Like it might make me strong enough to say, oh, is that the diagnosis you'd give to a thin person when they jump to diabetes without chest, without testing my blood or, you know, other crazy shit that doctors sometimes do. Um, and there's some medical stories in that episode too. Um, or, you know, uh, or sta- you know, standing up to a waiter or whatever. Like, you know, me thinking I'm pretty is not really the point. Uh, actually, chain, you know, trying to create an entire generation of people who don't equate thinness with the only path to health and happiness because that's such an automatic default setting, kind of like the way whiteness is the default setting and white Christian maleness is the default setting and anything else is, why are you being so PC? Um, You know, thinness is the ideal, except there's no reason for it to be. You know, my great-grandmother lived to be 98 years old. She was a big, strong, sturdy woman from the old country who, healthy as a fucking horse, that was not a thin woman. Not on no planet would anyone call her thin. But she was healthy, probably one of the healthiest people who's ever lived. And yet somehow when she died, they had to look for a cause of death. She was 98 years old. You know, they had to go, oh, we found some cancer cells somewhere in here. So I guess we're going to call it cancer. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. But, you know, I'm surprised they didn't say she died of fatness because, you know, she was a, she was a large woman. <laughs> she was, she was a, a sturdy, sturdy woman. <laughs> Bitchin' Boutique. Yes. Um, I think we need to give them a thing, Spike. We can give them a drop that they can play on their yes. show. Yes, I think we've uh, got to find some time and get, get time to do, do that. I think we should do it right now. I think we should do it right now. Look, I'll show you how easy it is, Spike. <laughs> Watch this. I'm just going to do it live. Okay, do it live. Like that bloke screams. I'm just going to do it live. Watch this. Hi, this is Dr. Dan from the Two Skeptical... Ske- I can't do it now. <laughs> Look, I can't speak. Too much pressure. Right, I'll try again. I'll try again. I'll try again. Take 52. Hi, this is Dr. Dan from the Two Skeptical Chaps podcast, and you are listening to the most bitchin' boutique. See? That was easy, wasn't it? Okay. They could send us one, we could play it in ass. Yeah, you yeah. Right, you do it. Yeah. Right, off What you do go. you want me to say? Whatever, whatever comes to mind. Hi, this is Spike from the Two Skeptical Chaps podcast, who ain't no bitch, but you're listening to the bitchin' boutique. Oh, that was good. I think I hope they use that. Let's see if they cut it and put it in their next show. <laughs> Diplomatic community. <laughs> But so one thing I would love 
from you guys. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to like, you know, make you work, but if you've been listening to us for a while and you have a favorite bit, if you have something that you want new listener that you think the new listeners should definitely hear. Like if you like, say for example, Blaine Stewart, I know you're listening. I happen to know that if Blaine Stewart was going to choose a bit for me to replay, it would be the story of Pitney's friend who was visiting him and he was having a little get together and he was like, oh, go get yourself a, oh, please eat, go enjoy some, some snacks. And his friend uh, informed him that she's not into dips. Somewhere right now, Blaine Stewart is really, really laughing. Although when I tell it, it's not nearly as funny as when Pitney tells it. But, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll play that one because I know that Blaine will, would request it. But, you know, you guys, if there's something in particular, maybe from, you know, within the first couple years or so, you know, request. I may I may put out some feelers. I may I may contact some of you directly. Just, uh, you know, don't make don't make it all be my picks. I you know, I know what I think is the best stuff, but I want to know what you guys think is the best stuff. What's the, what would be really, really fun to dust off? That would, that would be way fun. And, you know, speaking of clips, (laughs) for your reward for listening to me talk about fatness for the last, what's it been like 45 minutes? Um, I have pulled out a clip for you from from an episode called Ted Nugent Sucks way way back please enjoy a little uh, a little Mr. Diskette you have a Mr. Diskette shall I tell Mr. Diskette oh Mr. Diskette okay so like in the early days of the internet one time we were at this convention where um Okay, well, I'll just say that back when when Xena, Warrior Princess was on and Lucy Lawless was big, and and one year she uh, she sang the national anthem at a Detroit Red Wings game in a little red bustier and like an Uncle Sam hat. And at the end of the song, she threw her arms in the air and um, and her boobs popped out. And oh boy, you know what what there was of the internet then because it was fairly early. I mean, you you know, news groups and stuff were still the thing. But, you know, the internet kind of exploded. So fast forward to we're at a convention and this wheezing, (laughs) drooling guy. uh, I don't even remember. I don't even remember how it started. Uh, Did he, did he come up to me first or did I, why do I have the feeling that he went up to you first? (laughs) I brought him to you. You, yes. You directed him to me. You decided that he needed to be my responsibility. That he was wheezing and going on about Because I told Lucy. him that you knew where to find it. Yes. That Lucy Lawless is, oh, you know, oh, I hear that Lucy Lawless's uh, boobs popped out. And, uh, and so Pitney drags him over to me so that I get to show him. And, you know, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have laptops. We didn't have things like that. But at that convention, they had the foresight to set up like a computer room, like a hotel room that was basically filled with tables and stuff that had <coughs> de- desktop computers all over it. Then they were all connected to the internet and whatever so that people could, you know, check email or whatever. And so I took him in there. And of course, like, remember, I mean, there's still some people like this, but remember when people didn't understand that search engines existed and that they could find things too. You know, like if you knew where it was, they thought you were just going to, you had it memorized and you were just going to show them, like give them a URL that would take them. It's like, no, you fucking type it into Yahoo or whatever and it, and you search and you find it. That's, you know, that's how everybody finds everything. But you know, this guy was so excited that I was going to show him this picture that showed some nipple. And he would not shut up. 
about not about not only about the fact that I was doing this in a public place with people around. I just wanted to get them away from me. And it, and it was uh, like, you know, oh, and then, you know, we're going to find this picture and I'm going to save it on a diskette. And he wouldn't <laughs> stop saying diskette. So to this day, we still, we, we refer to him as Mr. Disquette. Disquette! So, Mr. Disquette was just like, oh, and then I'm going to see this picture and, and I'm going to save it on a disquette and then I'm going to take it home with me. It's like, yeah, yeah, don't, you don't have to continue. We know what you're going to do with it. So, but then later we're at a, we're at like a panel thing where Bruce Campbell was up on stage and doing like a Q and A. And, and someone towards the back said something. And then we hear this ah! from the back of the room and Bruce <laughs> says something like, you know, oh, you know, someone help that woman. And then from the back of the room you hear, I'm a man. And, <laughs> and we realized later that it was, it was Mr. Disquette. <laughs> oh, and you know, when you have one of those encounters and you think, where is he now? <laughs> He somewhere out there. He has a job, perhaps a family, perhaps he reproduced, you know, or perhaps not. <laughs> perhaps he still lives in his mother's basement. I don't know, but yeah, you meet all kinds. <laughs> yeah. That's a question. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy our show, please take a moment to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. If you send us a screenshot of your review, we'll send you a Bitchin' Boutique sticker. Everyone Everyone loves loves stickers. stickers! Please subscribe or add us to your favorites wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribers get new episodes first and are also more attractive. Drop us a line anytime at pitneyandamelia at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love it if you rate us and review us on Apple about... Shit. <laughs> That's why we're doing it. <laughs> We'd love it if you'd rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. God damn it. <laughs> the Podcasts. <laughs> Apple Podcasts. <laughs>